Chapter 11, Part 2. So as I promised you in part one, we are now going to look at some figural art in France. Um, and you will get to see that golden lady yet again. So society became increasingly complex as people moved to cities. Cities grew and their guilds and hierarchies. There are people who, there are artists and artisans who do different things. I think you'll see a little bit of that represented in the art today. So you can just imagine that things are becoming more um, civilized, more sophisticated. So um, <clears throat> these are two scenes from a moralized Bible. We have a page with Louis the Ninth and Blanche of Castile, his mother, uh, dating from 1226 to, to 34. It shows the royalty above and the men who made the book below. So we've got um, the king on the right up above with his scepter and his mother on the left. Um, the three-volume moralized Bible from about 1230 pairs scriptural passages with allegorical visual interpretations. I, I believe I have one example that's coming up to show you. Um, this is the, would have been the dedication page where the king had his portrait placed in there and illustrates the two men who made this, working on a manuscript here, so doing the work. Um, and you can see gold is very precious. I, I wouldn't say this is a, a good example of um, illusionistic art at all. So this is what the moralized Bible looked like. Um, there would be these little individual scenes or vignettes on the page, um, and they were paired either horizontally or vertically, where one scene would have something from the Bible, um, a story like saying, oh, remember when the Good Samaritan took that, that injured man into an inn? And then the other the other vignette that it was paired with might give an illustration from contemporary times saying how you could apply that lesson in your own life so it's it's definitely not in-depth bible study it's just very light uh, so the description of the biblical scene would require about that much text and the application about that much um, i'm not saying these were paired either way but that's how a um, moralized Bible work. And they're obviously very expensive. I mean, to have an artist fill pages with these uh, gold-filled pictures would have been, uh, nobody would have afforded this except the king, of course. And it was, hmm, coincidentally, it was owned by a king. So there's not a lot of moralized Bibles around, and they're very precious when they are. Um, Another book that was extremely popular is called The Book of Hours. And this, before we start looking at the book, we, I'm going to just tell you how it fit into society. So The Book of Hours contained prayers that were recited at devotional hours throughout the day um, and prayers mostly to the Virgin Mary. They became popular and were individualized to each wealthy patron. So this was the type of book a wealthy and literate person could own for their own personal devotional use. So there's a, a lot of things you can take out of that. And one is that people are no longer depending 100% on the church to guide them along their spiritual path, that they are being responsible themselves to have a prayer life and to take their prayers to um, God and the Virgin. And the second is that it's a very elitist thing, that not everybody did this. It would be only wealthy, literate people who could own these books, could pay for them. So another thing, I mean, we have several of these 
survive because uh, the upper class was also growing in wealth and number. But um, there's almost no audience. So the the people who made them put a lot of effort in. The, the illustrations are often extremely beautiful, but they're not publicly viewed, so they don't have influence even on other artists. They're just sort of a private dead-end art form, really. But we can still look at them and see it as a reflection of that time. So this is a picture that I like. It's a bonus feature that shows Mary of Burgundy doing what I just described. So she's a wealthy woman. Look at that very cool hat. Uh, and she's holding her book of hours and praying to the Virgin. She's treating her book with a lot of dignity and respect by not touching it with her dirty hands and using a silk cloth. She has her puppy on her lap. So she's praying at this moment, and this is what is going on in her imagination. She's envisioning herself, there's Mary, in the presence of the Virgin Mary, who is holding baby Jesus on her lap. So her act of praying puts her virtually in the presence of Mary. And down here is another one. This is Jean de Vreux, who is praying with her Book of Hours. And we're going to look at that Book of Hours a little bit closer. So this is a, an open two-page spread from a Book of Hours. We know the name of the artist who did this. Uh, it is... It was uh, Jean Poussel is the artist. And he made this for Jean de Vreux, who was the queen of France. So the hours of Jean de Vreux by Poussel were created using grisaille, which means shades of gray. It just looks like a black and white drawing with little color. Figures include Queen Jean herself, which is over here, reading her book of hours. The Kiss of Judas on this page. Uh, so there's Jesus. And Judas has come in to identify him and is kissing him so that the soldiers will arrest him. The kiss of Judas is paired with the scene of knights riding goats down here on the bottom. And then this side is the Annunciation. <clears throat> so uh, um, many things to point out here. And one is look at both the body, the figure of Virgin Mary over here and the figure of Jesus. They are both demonstrating that gothic S-curve. And Jesus has even like gripped his robe up over his left hip, giving those radiating lines. And Mary's doing the same thing over here. So the gothic S-curve, which I showed you in Rem's sculpture, and I said it was super trendy. Here it is in a book. Now, the thing that might blow your mind after you look at these beautiful illustrations is to look at the size of it. Each page is three and a half inches tall by two and a fourth inches wide. This is teensy, teensy, tiny book. So it would fit in Jean, Jean de Vreux's pocket, but uh, this might be a little on the thick side. But it's incredible to imagine all of this, this fine drawing done with just a quill pen on a tiny, tiny, teeny, tiny little page. And then look at all these little teensy, weensy drawings up here. It's just amazing. And here's another piece that was also uh, made, made by, the, by Jean de Vreux. The same queen of France. So religious subjects became more emotionally expressive in small, precious objects. A silver gilt image of the virgin and child shows Jesus' tender gesture of caressing his mother's cheek, the little baby. The baby's also looking very cute here. Um, also known as the Golden Virgin of Jean de Vreux because she was the patron. So I hope you got the connection that she's the, the patron of this book and the patron of this statue, which used to be in the Louvre. Or I guess it still is in the Louvre. Here's, um, and when I told you the baby was cute, I mean, look at that little baby. He's, he doesn't look scary like some of those Romanesque babies. He actually looks kind of cute. 
is reaching up and touching mother's cheek. And she tips her head over to show she loves him. Now, dramatic difference, isn't it? Romanesque versus Gothic. They're both from France. One is from a rural area, one is from a city, but I think it's more the time periods that make a difference. That when I say um, Gothic art becomes softer and gentler, it absolutely does. And because the Virgin Mary is so important now in this culture, um, the, the idea of making her beautiful and graceful is important. So you have an appreciation of grace and beauty. Um, and that's our beautiful virgin that obviously uh, grace and beauty wasn't, wasn't what that was about at all, the Romanesque one. So here's some more figural art that's completely secular. I know you must be getting very tired of Virgin Mary and Jesus and churches and everything. That's, that's okay. That's where the money was, and that's what people made, and that's what they cared about. So we have more of that than anything else. But there's some secular art. So secular subject matter included romantic love, the lid of an ivory box likely given as courtship or a wedding gift portrays a scene of jousting, which was um, an entertainment by nobles, people who were very wealthy, who had horses and knights and all that. Uh, symbols of sexual surrender and fertility are enhanced by actual depictions of Cupid and flirtation. So the knights jousting are down here. This is... Um, this is the main part of the scene. But then there are the spectators up above, a whole gallery of people watching. There's a Cupid shooting an arrow at some poor person down here who can't help but fall in love. And you have people flirting up here in the, the, um, the stands. So it's, it's fun. It just shows you that their life wasn't all about religion. They were interested in many things. Um, now, that style, that French style, got picked up and copied in all the other countries of Europe eventually. So slightly later, but everybody loved that and wanted to imitate that. So English churches did not emphasize height as much as the length of the nave. The cathedral at Salisbury typifies the English style. So this is in England. We're only going to look at one church in England, so we can be thankful for that. And this is, this is the one church. So uh, the church of Salisbury is in a park-like setting with attached cloister and chapter house. This, this means that there was a monastery attached to this church originally. Um, the crossing tower here. This huge tower boasts a spire of extraordinary height. The interior reflects Norman traditions. So after 1066, England becomes um, a very Norman country. It was Anglo-Saxon, then it's Norman. There's two transepts here, by the way, and a very square-ended apse. So quite different from French. Here's the plan of Salisbury. So you can see the square-ended apse, the double transepts. I believe the tower was much later. And this is the interior of the nave of Salisbury. So um, that first slide that described it said that it's not as vertical, not the emphasis is not so much on the soaring verticality as we saw in France. And here it illustrates it by having these very strong horizontal lines that lead the eye down here to the end. The, the feeling today is that the English wanted people's attention to be on the priest who was down here performing the Mass. They didn't want their eyes to wander up above. So, for example, the line from these piers uh, would not shoot straight up to the, the vaulting like it did in France, but instead would shoot up on this arch and come back down. So... And then you have this different colored stone. So you have a dark marble here and a light one here, a dark and a light to give you more of a sense of these horizontal lines. 
some figural art from England, so they were making books also. The English style is quite different from the French style. Early medieval manuscript tradition survived into the Gothic period. The opening pages of the windmill Psalter here portray the tree of Jesse, a genealogy of Jesus' ancestors from Isaiah, and the elaborate second letter E. So this is the letter B here. Um, this opens... Psalm 1, which starts in Latin, Beatus Vir, which means blessed is the man. Uh, so there's the B, and over here is the letter E. I think you can see those. It's called the windmill Psalter because there's a tiny little windmill up at the top of the E, and there's lots of figures. This is Jesse. This is Jesse. And from his stomach comes the root of Jesse, um, the lineage of Jesus, and Jesus is up at the very top. So you can see it's, it's very elaborate, very beautiful. It's got real gold in it. Um, the English were also famous for needlework. So here's a, a vestment that has this amazing embroidery on it in thread of gold. Um, that's what medieval people called the gold thread. Thread of gold. Side by side now, Chart and Salisbury, just to show you the uh, main difference between the two, is that French cathedrals tended to be in the center of urban areas. They would be in the hearts of cities, and the English would surround them with more of a lawn, and that's because also uh, this was a, a cemetery, so they would bury their dead in the churchyard. Um, I don't know where the French buried their dead, probably another cemetery somewhere else. But anyway, you can see these differences. The English like the big setting. And we have over here the cloister connected, which not seen in France. So the style of, uh, that's it for England, by the way, and we're moving on. So the style of architecture also gets picked up and uh, by the, people in Germanic lands and adapted in a way that um, is unique to them. And they create what's called a hall church. So I, I'm sorry, I have really bad pictures of this church, but I'll try to explain it. So a hall church featured a nave, which is the center part, with side aisles and vaults of equal height, meaning that the side aisle is not lower, and there's no gallery here, and there's no clear story. It's just a side aisle with long lancet windows. Um, the Church of the Holy Cross was an elaboration of the Hall Church. Architects Heinrich and Peter Parler designed a vast triple-aisled choir. Peter was called on to build the cathedral at Prague following this project. The unity of space was enhanced by a complex web vault, and that's what this is. So both the English and the German people make extremely elaborate vaults um, that have lots of intersecting ribs up on the top. It's called webbing, sometimes fan vaulting. Um, and I'm sorry, we don't have time to go into all of the Gothic, but we could have an entire course on Gothic if uh, we wanted. This is the exterior of that church. So you can see there's no indication of a low side aisle here. Instead, you have very high windows along the side and some very small rose windows um, and buttressing, no flying buttressing, just regular old uh, bumped up against the wall buttressing. So it's really different from French Gothic. And here's um, a structure that is also Gothic, but we're going to look at this. It will show up on the quiz because it is a different form of Gothic. And this is, a, it's called the uh, Altneuschul, which means the Old New Synagogue, and it's in Prague. And it's very small Gothic. It doesn't have that soaring verticality. It's very sort of scaled down. It also doesn't have stained glass windows, so um, let's read this. Prague's old new synagogue has two focal points, the Aaron for the Torah scrolls and the raised bima platform. Like a hall church, its vaults are the same height. It has six bays, 
um, and they're all of the same height. So you can see that there's like two aisles here in each. Aisle. That's one bay. Oops, I scoot it. And another one, and we're standing in one. And um, rib vaulting up here. What you don't see is a lot of imagery. You don't see sculptural programs. You don't see stained glass windows. I think there are small stained glass windows, but that's um, just for some illumination. This is what it looks like from the outside. So it really doesn't even look like a religious structure. It just looks kind of like a house. Um, this is the Altmaishul in Prague. And it will show up as a question on the quiz where I'll ask you what religion is practiced here. So it might serve you well to look and notice that there's Hebrew writing on the wall and there's a Star of David up here. So um, this is Jewish. Judaism was practiced here. And here's another hall church. This one I'm sure has been heavily restored because it is in Berlin, Germany. And Berlin was the capital of Hitler's Germany. It was heavily bombed during the war. There was a lot of damage. Um, but this is uh, St. Maria something, something. And it's a hall church, so you can see how these the side aisles don't exist. There's just really tall lancet windows on the exterior. And the interior looks like this. So in this example, it looks very graceful and beautiful and not segmented. Um, this has been converted to a Protestant church, as most of the churches in the north of Germany are now. And because of the damage during the war, the stained glass, if there was stained glass, has been replaced by plain glass now. So um, it just looks very bright and white. Simple. This is the end of Chapter 11, Part 2. And next we will be going seeing what's happening down in Italy.